Thank you, Minister. Um, thank you for making the time to celebrate with us today. And in particular, thank you for those very, very kind words. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Um, I know on Monday you were really impressed with the person who spoke before you at the event, Lisa. Um, she gave a speech at an event at the House of, of Lords that was so full of vision and passion and a superb insight into what works to lift women out of the criminal justice system. And I was beaming with pride because just before she'd gone on stage, Lisa and I had been talking about how she'd been part of one of our forums a couple of years ago. And she said that being part of the forum was truly transformative for her. She said it had been a key part of her recovery. And that journey has now led her not only back to wellness, but into employment, and she is absolutely fl flourishing. So for me, it was such a wonderful start to the week to hear that our model of changing the world with people with lived experience had absolutely changed her world. Because the need to change the world is as pressing now as it was when we were set up 25 years ago. We've achieved so much in that time, but there is much yet to do for those in the revolving door of crisis and crime. So we define that revolving door as low-level repeated crime driven by multiple problems. And to get a measure of this, we've had a look at the convictions and cautions for theft or summary non-motoring offences that were committed last year. And because we set the bar quite high to be part of the revolving door group, we only looked at, at offences that, that had been committed by people who already had 11 or more convictions. And this gave us a total of 60,000 low-level offences last year. Then we looked at how many times the people who had committed those offences had previously been convicted or cautioned for the same minor offences, so for theft and summary non-motoring. We found that that was 1,800,000 times. The people who committed those 60,000 minor offences last year had been in formal contact with the criminal justice system 1,800,000 times before for the same minor offences. Now that looks to us like 1,800,000 opportunities to stop the revolving door. Because pernicious as it is, we believe the revolving door can be stopped, and this remains our vision. Over the last 25 years, we've taken really significant steps to that vision. So we've moved a group from complete invisibility to the heart of the criminal justice debate. We're particularly proud to have pioneered and evidenced the link worker model, and it's wonderful to see how many people that's now helping. We're equally proud that we pioneered the system change model, the system change approach that's gained traction and is fundamentally changing public services in so many areas. And as the minister was saying, we also celebrate the services that we helped create and support, the National Appropriate Adult Network, Liaison and Diversion, because that work in collaboration and in partnership leads to better criminal justice solutions. Of course, very often the best criminal justice solution is diversion out of the criminal justice system. But exiting the revolving door does remain hard. And I and the staff team and the lived experience team, we remain absolutely inspired by watching people make that phenomenal journey. It is truly inspirational when you see it. And we use our charity's knowledge to ha about how people can be supported to exit the revolving door to help service providers and commissioners improve their services. And we do this through evaluations and we do it through helping them hear the lived experience insight that is absolutely essential to building great services. And I think ethically we need to continue to do this because it's our mission to share our learning and the evidence of what works to drive improvement. We're in a really privileged position of being independent from service provision. So we can be intellectually curious, and we must use this to drive real-world real change. But a couple of years ago, I was at a forum, and I was talking to a member of the forum. He was a guy about my age, and he'd spent his entire adult life in and out of prison. He couldn't quite remember how many of those short sentences that we know of disruptive and ineffective he'd done. He thought it was about 20. And we were talking about what might have been different when his life could have taken a different course, how he could have been prevented from entering the revolving door. 
And as you would expect, these conversations took us back to his young adulthood and it took it back to his childhood. Because what we've repeatedly heard from the 2,500 people who we've spoken to over the last five years is a remarkably consistent picture of, of childhood. And that's a childhood that's blighted both by poverty and by trauma. And I'm sure, and the minister referred to it, that many of us are aware of the growing interest in trauma and the growing interest in adverse childhood experiences. And it's evident in public health, it's in prisons, as the minister mentioned, it's in community sentences, and our neighbours in Scotland and Wales are certainly very interested at the moment. The research we've been piloting recently is, is finding strikingly high levels of adverse childhood experiences. So we're finding multiple and repeated experiences of neglect, of abuse, and of, of household dysfunction. And that's the typical pattern. But as challenging and as completely horrific as these individual and family experiences are, they are only part of the picture because we are also finding that poverty is a universal factor. And in most cases, this is poverty so profound that even the necessities of life, three square meals, a warm coat, can't be guaranteed. And these households are not just in poverty, but in the context of community violence. The direct experience of that community violence, of family members being murdered, of friends being beaten up, of families being driven from their homes is as stark as the, as the poverty and it's as stark as the adverse childhood experiences. So we think that a fuller picture of childhoods is a necessity and we're extending our research to start including the childhood experience of racism. We started trying to reflect in our work this fuller understanding. So we hope, for example, that the podcast series, in other words, that we launched on Monday, will bring fresh thinking to trauma and poverty and to the implications for services. We have, of course, known for some time that trauma and poverty are core, but we're now committed to putting this understanding front and centre in our work because it's not just about knowing, it's about doing. We think a key site for intervention are the early stages of the criminal justice system in young adulthood because there is very often a Rubicon that is crossed in young adults' lives between the damaging childhood that becomes the adult revolving door. And that Rubicon is the criminal justice system itself. We know the damage it can do. We know it entrenches disadvantage and drags people into the revolving door. We know a conviction makes employment less likely. We know imprisonment drives the homelessness. But we also know that appropriate diversion has better outcomes for the individual and better outcomes for the community. So we need to start leveraging those 1,800,000 opportunities to make criminality in the future less and not more likely. Of course, we know that most of the interventions needed to turn a life around sit outside the criminal justice system. We know that police officers aren't substance misuse workers. We know that our prosecutors are not mental health workers. But they are the decision makers who can set lives in different directions. Diversion, deferred prosecution, out of court disposal sit in their gift and can be the difference between recovery or entrenchment. So we need new strategic responses and different decision making to support young adults away from the revolving door. So how are we gonna do this? Well, we'll do it in the revolving doorway. We will do it in the way we did when we developed the link worker model, or we pioneered system change, or we co-created the peer support element of liaison and diversion. So first, we will build knowledge, and that knowledge base will bring together the unique insight of lived experience with robust research. But then we're going to be impatient for real life change, so we're gonna use that knowledge to co-develop practical solutions with practitioners and with policymakers, Our tradition guides us to be practical. And we also know that very often practice is ahead of policy. We're gonna recognize that we don't have all of the answers, but we are very good at asking the right question. And in doing so, we will work in collaboration because this ambition is far too big for one organization. So finally, we will share and give away our learning to the movement, to build a movement 
that can match this ambition. And our hope is that you will join with us, you will collaborate with us, together we can start building a movement to use those 1,800,000 opportunities. And perhaps you'll use your commitment card tonight to start that process. Before I close, can I, say, can I beg your indulgence for three quick thank yous? I promise you they'll be, they'll be quick. Firstly, to the sector, um, for the support they provided to Revolving Doors Agency. I've been struck by the generosity of many of my predecessors, of our trustee and our staff alumni, many of whom are still in the sector, and indeed of the sector generally. You have been really supportive to Revolving Doors over the years. Secondly, can I say thank you to the wonderful Revolving Doors staff team? I quite often have to put people right about the size of Revolving Doors because they think we are three or four times the size we are. And that's entirely testament to the talent and the dedication and the hard work of a staff team who all deliver impact to the, delivery, to the, um, to the <coughs> factor of three or four. And lastly, can I say thank you to our superb lived experience colleagues for their dedication in changing the world with us. Revolving Door success entirely depends on the combined expertise of lived experience of the trustee team and of the staff team. So I look forward to the lived experience team, the trustees and the staff teams working together. And I look forward to us working together to prevent people from entering the revolving doors by using those 1,800,000 opportunities. Thank you. Um, in that spirit, I'm just going to introduce a very quick film that our lived experience team made with our staff team um, and made it together.